What is up, everyone? It is your boy, The Bear, and welcome to Bear Reacts. Today, I have something truly intriguing lined up just for you. We'll be diving into the world of biblical mysteries as we react to Watch Mojo's 10 Unsolved Bible Mysteries video. The Bible and ancient texts filled with stories, prophecies, and enigmas that have puzzled scholars and believers for centuries. From unexplained miracles to mis mysterious disappearances and hidden messages, the Bible holds a treasure trove of unsolved riddles that continue to captivate our curiosity. Now, let's buckle up and join the experts at Watch Mojo as they take us through some of these mind-boggling enigmas. As we embark on this journey together, I can't help but wonder what secrets lie within these ancient texts. Are there hidden codes that can unlock the mysteries of the universe? Do these unsolved puzzles offer glimpses into events yet to come? Get ready to explore the unexplained and embark on a quest for knowledge. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell so you won't miss any of this exciting content, and I'm just gearing up. All right, folks, without further ado, let's roll that intro. Right, I'm kind of excited for this. The Holy Grail may be Christianity's most desired relic, but it's also its most elusive. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we'll be discussing 10 unsolved mysteries of the Bible. 2,000 years ago, in a remote part of the Roman Empire, someone was born who would change the history of the world. For this video, we'll be addressing the most enduring and mystifying questions surrounding stories okay. from the Christian Bible. Which of these mysteries captures your imagination? Let us know in the comments. Where is the Ark of the Covenant? Fans of the Indiana Jones franchise know the supposed relic and artifact all too well. I love Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's a, it's a great movie. The Ark of the Covenant is thought to be a golden chest that's said to contain some of the Israelites' most sacred treasure. The Israelites build a holy vessel, a sacred box, to hold these tablets of the commandments. But where is it now? The Books of the Maccabees states that the prophet Jeremiah buried the Ark in a cave, yet the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church has claimed to possess the Ark That's in the modern true. day. The Ark shifts from Israel. They also took, uh, I guess when Israel was uh, wiped out by the Babylonians, I think that's where they took it. I could be wrong, but I, from what I remember, that's what happened to it. Now to Ethiopia and becomes the, the possession of the Ethiopian nation. And it tells us why the Ark lies at the focus of worship in the church. Meanwhile, every Orthodox church in the Ethiopian region possesses its own replica of the Ark, bringing up more questions as to the authenticity of these claims. What is the beast? Don't forget, man, is that not only did it hold the Ten Commandments, it held a lot of other uh, pieces to biblical history inside that Ark of the Covenant. I can't remember what they are off the top of my head. Maybe you guys could let me know in the comments down below, but there's more than just the original Ten Commandments. There's so much more in there. And when the Ark of the Covenant... Only the, the main priest was allowed to go into the, the, the chapel where that was at to pray for it. And they would actually walk backwards, I believe, because the just the aura of God coming off of that would actually make you go blind. No, we're not talking about the end time beast of Revelation that's foretold by the Bible to rise up prior to Armageddon. Instead, a lesser known but no less curious beast is mentioned in the book of Job and its name is Behemoth. Behemoth and another monster named Leviathan are both referenced in Job. They are chaotic entities that were created by God during the time of Adam and Eve. However, neither Behemoth nor Leviathan possess many references after this point in the Bible. That's true. What happened to them and where are they now? Were they biblical analogies for dinosaurs? Are they too due to take part in the great battle detailed in Revelation? No one seems to know. I actually uh, heard that it is uh, referencing dinosaurs. Um, that's what I was taught growing up. Um, but these were beasts that the Bible depicted, and a lot of the, the a lot of them kind of reference. If you look at it, like if you squint your eyes really hard and look at it, it does it, it kind of dinosaurs. But um, again, these are just enigmas, and I didn't think that they were going to come up on that one. But that's actually a really good one. The Wealth of Ophir The wealth of King Solomon is legendary. The biblical King Solomon was reported to have traded with the kingdom of Ophir, a port city That's that true. was said to harbor wealth in gold, silver, and more. 
To date, however, geographers and mapmakers are still unsure as to the exact whereabouts of Ophir. Modern-day theories detail Ophir as a once-popular trading route that could have been located within the area of Sri Lanka, India, or the Philippines. It isn't only in the Old Testament where Ophir is mentioned either. That's Yet true. its true existence today feels like more of a myth than anything with a solid answer. Point to the matter is... I think Ophir is one of the, kind of like uh, the great um, city of Atlantis. It's just, it's just lost to time. I mean, the, the world map has changed so much over time that we don't even know where a lot of these places are in the Bible. There's a lot that we do know because they kept their, the same thing, but there's just so many places in the Bible that don't even, like Eden, we don't know where that's at. They try to say it's in Africa, but we don't really know, especially if you believe in like Pangea and stuff like that. It could have been anywhere is that here in the same archaeological context as the Solomonic period, here comes a, a reference to gold from Ophir. The end times. In addition to the chaotic warfare detailed in the book of Revelation, there's also a period of time that's labeled the millennium. This is, according to Revelation, a thousand year period of Jesus' reign upon the earth. The world will live in peace, Satan will be bound, and at the beginning everyone will worship God. However, there's no specific timetable for this reign, and many biblical scholars remain unclear on its true meaning. Some Christians believe in some sort of end time event where Jesus Christ will return to the world as king. God promised the That's called the rapture. I don't know if they're gonna if they're gonna mention it, but it's called the rapture in modern day Christianity when Christ comes back and takes people out of the out of just gone in a blink of an eye. Um the nations of the world that they would live in peace with Jesus as their ruler. Others believe the millennium to be more of a metaphor with regards to the Christian message. Or could we be currently living in the millennium with the end times soon to follow? Who knows? Jesus. There's a, um, there's another thing, um, that they're talking about. There's another, oh, um, that they talk about another um the end time uh the book of revelation speaking about uh nero they they say that the that it's talking about nero the whole book of revelation is referring to the the reign of nero so there's a lot of different parts moving parts when it comes to the end times and what you believe in i'm not here to preach to you guys but um it could all it could be referring to Nero. It could also be referring to the rapture. Let me know what you guys believe in the comments down below. Um, I have my beliefs, um, but let me know what you guys think in below. Do you believe it's an actual end time prophecy or do you think it's referring to Nero? Is there another way that you look at it? Let me know in the comments down below. This is missing years. It is one of the world's great mysteries. Yes. A biblical conundrum that has baffled scholars for years. The biblical life of Jesus Christ takes a huge jump from his birth and early childhood like 30 straight years. into his adult life as a preacher and prophet. However, there's still a chunk of Christ's life that remains undocumented. The life of Jesus Christ is unaccounted for. There is no written record. There are no tales told. The SBS television network in Australia attempted to shine a little light on this subject back in 2017 with an article that offered up some theories. The article details an 1894 discovery of what purported to be manuscripts authored to Jesus Christ. These were claimed to have been found within a Tibetan monastery, leading some to believe that Jesus traveled the earth seeking knowledge. Other stories claim that Jesus might have spent time in Japan and the UK, although concrete evidence has yet to surface. Personally, I... I I just think from, you know, the year he was born until he started his ministry, until he got baptized, he was probably working with his dad, Joseph. He was probably carpentering with his dad because that's usually what, you, like, if you think about what farmers back in the 1800s, the kids went and helped the dad and, to run the farm. I'm sure that Jesus and his brothers, because Mary also had other kids, not just Jesus, they went and I bet I'm almost guaranteeing that he was helping his dad run a carpentry business because he was a carpenter from Nazareth. It, it makes so much sense. It, that's what I think. I mean, there's little pieces in there where he would preach to the, to the, to the, uh, to the uh, Pharisees and all that stuff um, and get in trouble for doing that. But in, in real talk, if you're really thinking about it, he's probably just doing kid stuff and helping his dad in his carpentry business. That's what I believe. Let me know what you believe in the, in the comments down below. Nature abhors a vacuum. 
and so do many religious folks. And that's why many people have talked about these missing years and have tried to speculate about what Jesus might have done during that time. Where is the Holy Grail? The Holy Grail may be Christianity's most desired this relic, the cup. but it's also its most elusive. The location of the Holy Grail ties into the subject of Jesus visiting the United Kingdom, specifically with regards to a saint named Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea acquires the cup from the Last Supper and then takes it and is physically present at the crucifixion and uses it to collect Christ's blood. Both the legend of Joseph and the Grail are intrinsically linked to the theory that Arimathea was actually located somewhere in England, potentially what is now Glastonbury. The Grail itself is said to be the cup utilized by Jesus at the Last Supper, and the Bible says that it was Joseph who assisted in burying Christ after his crucifixion. However, where is the Grail now? Conspiracies and theories abound as to its location to the point where the word Grail is now commonly used to describe something that's coveted to the point of obsession. It's important because it's just I personally just think it was lost to time. I mean, is it really that important? I don't think it's important. I mean, it's a cup that they drank out of during the Last Supper. I mean, the Last Supper is important. The actual, the Eucharist is important. But other than that, dude, it's to me, to me, let me know your thoughts, but to me, it's just a cup. Symbol of renewal and power, and that anyone who has it has the power that's associated with it. Is Eden real? The book of Genesis claims that God created a garden in the east of Eden, I said Eden. where he settled Adam and Eve. There they prospered, raising sons, Cain the farmer and Abel the shepherd. The Garden of Eden is thought of as a fictional paradise where we want for nothing and everything is idyllic. Was Eden fictional though, or was it a real place? It's a fascinating question and one that still comes up for biblical scholars around the world. There is conjecture that explains Eden may have once been located within the Persian Gulf region, due to a passage in the book of Genesis that references the Tigris River. Scholars today believe that Eden was located where the Tigris and Euphrates once joined two other local rivers. That actually makes a lot of sense though. Flowing out into the Persian Gulf and where, conveniently, the first signs of human civilization appear in the archaeological record. There's also an idea that Eden is a mindset, a feeling of innocence that's connected with that. a closeness to God. Still others claim that it was the holy city of Jerusalem that once birthed civilization. We will likely never know for sure. I don't think we'll ever know unless you actually believe in Christianity, and then you'll probably know the secrets once you die, but, I mean, to me, it's just, it's not a big deal where, where it's at. I mean, we, the humanity was kicked out of it, so it is what it is. I mean, we're not going to be able to get back to it. We're so far gone in sin. Who knows? When was Jesus born? 2,000 years ago, in a remote part of the Roman Empire, someone was born who would change the history of the world. The biblical life of Jesus Christ is one that's full of questions. In addition to the it's aforementioned true. mystery of Jesus' missing years, there's also the lack of an exact date for both his birth and death. Granted, holidays such as Christmas and Easter both celebrate these events, but their position on the calendar year is more symbolic than specific. That's true. Additionally, there's a disconnect as to what's mentioned in the Bible and what's been written down within Roman census data of the day. Herod the Great is mentioned in the Bible, yet the census places his official death and Jesus' potential birth in remarkably close proximity. Of all the characters in the birth stories, King Herod is one of the few for whom we have alternative contemporary historical sources. Scholars today generally place Jesus' birth at around 4, 5, or 6 BC, but there's nothing concrete. It's just extraordinary to come here now and see these crowds who come from all over the world that, still being drawn by the power of that moment that would change everything. The missing books. The modern day Bible wasn't the only text that was considered sacred to the Israelites. There are a number of other books and authors mentioned in the Bible that have somehow become lost over the years. The Book of Numbers references one of these lost books, the Book of the Wars of the Lord, which is believed to be a collection of poems. These poems may be similar to the Scalds of Norse mythology, in that they are said to detail wars fought by the armies of God against the enemies of Israel. The idea that the Bible may in fact be incomplete is one that captivates many, particularly those who hunger for more esoteric knowledge of the era. Before we, I personally think that um, the Bible's complete. It's it's as good as it's going to get. Um, but it really depends on, on what you believe, because you got to remember there was a whole group of people under King. Um, it wasn't King J James, but it was under. Um, Oh, I forgot his name. 
where he had just went from being a pagan to a Christian and he, they had a convention and they, they decided what books and argued what books should be allowed in the Bible. And that's how we got our modern Bible. I can't remember the name of the king, though. Um, but that's how we got our modern Bible during that convention of just people just coming together and deciding it. Could there be more books added? Sure. Why not? I mean, knowledge is power. And I believe there's a lot of knowledge that we need. But is it complete? Um I personally believe so. I think it's as complete as we're going to be able to get. The name of God. There is a lot of back and forth with regards to terminology used to pronounce the name of God. The Tetragrammaton refers to the letters YHWH or sometimes YHVH, and it's supposed to be how one spells God's name. However, some Christian writers have pronounced the Tetragrammaton as Yahweh or Jehovah, while Jewish cultures often replace the Tetragrammaton with Adonai or Hashem which translates to the name. God was written in the Bible as revealing his name to Moses, yet actual pronunciation of the name was generally limited to acts of prayer within the Temple of Jerusalem. Today, with the temple destroyed, historical sure. documentation of the Tetragrammaton's correct pronunciation has been lost to the sands of time. That's true. That is so true. That is so true. His name is powerful, and it's supposed to hold gravitas. So... You are not even supposed to speak the name of God because it's so powerful and you're not supposed to use it in, in vain. Um, it's one of the Ten Commandments. Dang, that was uh, fantastic. I, I, I kind of agree with those all being really good mysteries of the Bible. Um, things that we will probably never, never know. And like uh, the, my favorite one out of that list was probably the name of God um, because there's so much debate over who he is, what his name is, how to pronounce it. That's Those are key things in the Bible that we all want to know. And I think they do a damn good job of trying to put it all together. And uh, I personally use Yahweh or Jehovah. Um, I'm, not Mus I'm not Jewish or Muslim, so that those are the names that I use. But I don't think, I think it, the name of God is different. Like you, different religious, different, different uh, people are going to say it different. But it's nice to know that these are the top 10 um, mysteries of the Bible. And I think there's so many more. They should do a part two of this if they haven't done one already. But let me know your thoughts on this. What do you think of this list? Do you think it's incomplete? What would you add? What would you take away? Let me know your thoughts on it. I would certainly, definitely like to know. I hope you all have a good day. God bless. And as always, deuces. Until next time, keep rocking.